from contributing sponsor, Essential Strategies, managing partner, Mark Speak. You're introducing John Sellers. Hello, I'm Mark Speak with Essential Strategies. We're very glad to be a co-sponsor today on this. I hope everybody's got as much as we've got out of it today. Uh, some great speakers and some great networking. And that's what this has all been about, is the networking. Uh, we started working about a year ago with 417 and some different things, and they're just a great organization for that networking. I'm gonna be uh, introducing John Sellers, and we're gonna talk about some Springfield history. And this is a particular subject that I really enjoy and have always uh, looked at. Uh, just real quickly, a couple of quick points about essential strategies. We're basically an employee benefit consulting group. And if you ever hear those commercials on TV for car insurance where they're all gonna save you all that money, and if you just call and they're gonna save you 15%. Uh, we actually specialize in saving about 100%. And so if you ever wanna have a 15 minute conversation, just let us know. Be glad to talk to you. Uh, as consultants, that's what we do. We just talk. And if there's any interest, we, dr we drill on down from there. Uh, again, I'm gonna introduce John Sellers. Uh, he's gonna talk to you about the um, Springfield Art uh, History Museum. And uh, Springfield does have a colorful past. Uh, so I guess, are we ready for John? Without further ado, John Sellers. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon. How about that weather, huh? <laughs> I'm John Sellers. I'm executive director of the History Museum on the Square. And today we're gonna to have some lessons from the past that can shape our future. Now I'm gonna talk about two different things. They happened uh, about 100 years apart. But they both have significant impact on the city even today. Now the first thing I'm gonna tell you about, once I get used to this microphone pulling on the side of my head, is <laughs> uh, about the city of Springfield in itself. Now the city of Springfield was born at the crossroads of seven Native American trails. Now the reason that these trails all met here is because of the abundance of fresh water. Now most of the communities to the east of us found their growth and their ability to build because of navigable waters. They could, they could bring boats in and out. And ours wasn't that way. Ours was mostly spring-fed, large pools of water that provided an abundance of wild game and also water for the Native Americans as they passed through here in their travels, either as indigenous people like the Osage or, tr or tribes that were relocated here and resettled here from the east, like the Delaware and the uh, uh, Kickapoo and others that came through here. Uh, as I said, it was born at this, at this crossroads, as you can see it there on this old map of Indian trails in Missouri. And uh, as time went on, other travelers used these trails, explorers, people who wanted to make their fortune in the new west which Missouri was at that time, across the Mississippi River. And so uh, those Indian trails were easy ways for them to travel. And so they came here and found an abundance of water and a, uh, an abundance of large, straight trees to build their cabins. And so they began to settle here. By the time of the first railroad surveys in the 1850s, Springfield was quite a community. It had a land office, a post office, it was the county seat of a newly established Green County that encompassed what is now 10 and a half counties in Southwest Missouri. And uh, it was a town on the grow. And the people here were very positive about it and very, very excited about it. Well, as they began to talk about building railroads to the west from St. Louis and connecting St. Louis with the west coast, uh, Springfield became very involved. They raised a significant amount of money among the local people. Uh, they sent lobbyists to Washington and to St. Louis to lobby for the route to come through Springfield. And the railroad did their first surveys through this area in the 1850s. 
And in those surveys, they came to the conclusion that because of the limited amount of power on these old trains and the limited amount of stopping power because they had no real brakes, that they needed to be on level ground for their track, which would take them about a mile and a quarter north of the city of Springfield, which was established where the water was. So they told the city, we're going to have to come north of you. And when we get closer from St. Louis, uh, if you'll build a depot, we will build a spur track down uh, to the city and connect it with the main line. And the city said, okay, we'll think about that. We'll, we'll look into that. Well, over the course of the next 10 years, a lot of things happened in the city of Springfield. As we all know, the Civil War happened. But first, we became a hub for a new form of transport in 1858, or 1858 with the Overland Stage Line. And the Overland Stage Line made a station stop on the square in Springfield. So we're used to having that travel and communication. And uh, they felt that that would also cement their ability to get that railroad depot, even without uh, building it themselves. Along with that, uh, the Civil War broke out. Springfield was pretty well evenly divided between North and South. A lot of the Southern sympathizers chose to move to the South to uh, areas that were more conducive to their, their uh, leanings as far as the Civil War. And a lot of Northern sympathizers at the same time came to Springfield for the safety or relative safety of a town controlled by the Union Army. So in, by the end of the Civil War in 1865, Springfield had been under martial law for over three years, uh, but it had also doubled in size. It had grown because a lot of those people, when the war ended, there were Southern sympathizers that had left during the war, came back to stay. So the population almost doubled. And there was also that constant drumbeat that the railroad was going to come to Springfield. So by 1868, when the railroad was between Rolla and Lebanon, uh, they notified the city that they were going to be coming through within the next year, year and a half. And uh, what was the city's intentions as far as building that uh, depot? Well, the city decided to pass them by, to let the depot go. And the railroad decided that they would pass the city by and move to the north. At this point, a group of investors led by a man named Sempronius Boyd, uh, Pony Boyd, they called him, who was a Civil War veteran, had come here from the east and made his fortune in Springfield. He and a group of other investors decided that they would buy up all the land along that railroad right-of-way. And they went to the railroad and said, look, we've bought up all the land alongside your right-of-way. We know that you need water, you need fuel, you need people to work the line. Why don't you help us and we'll build a new community? And the railroad thought that was a pretty good idea. So when the first train pulled into Springfield in April of 1870, it pulled into a new city called North Springfield, a new city totally divided from Old Springfield by Division Street. That's why we have a Division Street. Some people probably didn't know that, but most of you probably did because you've heard me talk at other things. <laughs> uh, so and two cities divided at Division Street with the investors and the infrastructure growing this new railroad community, and the city of Springfield becoming very insecure and very unhappy with their, uh, their holdings. They had no railroad. They had no impact on this, uh, this new venture. They couldn't control it. So began a period of constant, perpetual con conflict and friction between two communities, each one trying to outdo the other. They, they were just so invigorated in trying to be the main city. Was it going to be Springfield? Was it going to be North Springfield? Springfield had the advantage of most of the businesses. North Springfield had the advantage of the transportation hub. So Springfield decided, well, since they have a railroad, we need one too. So they began to work on a railroad that would go north and south, since 
North Springfield had one east and west. And so over the next few years, there developed a conflict about railroads, a conflict about everything. This is Sempronius Boyd, by the way. This is, he looks like a uh, land speculator, doesn't he? <laughs> kind of, uh, he, he was an amazing man. He, he did so many things for the city of Springfield over the course of time, and ultimately became our representative to the court of Siam and passed away from an illness he contracted while he was in Siam in the 1880s. He was uh, quite a fellow. But back to our story. So this is North Springfield. This is the way it was. Businesses popping up all along, new, big, sturdy brick buildings. And the city of Springfield wanted to, wanted to look the same way. So that when anything happened in North Springfield, Springfield tried to top it. When anything happened in Springfield, North Springfield tried to top it. The city of North Springfield needed a hotel for their railroad travelers. So they built the uh, Ozark Hotel at the corner of Benton and Commercial Street, right by the depot, so that there was a place for train passengers to stay. Well, the city of Springfield didn't even have a railroad. They had no, they had no reason for it, but they built the Metropolitan Hotel because it was bigger. No other reason. It was just bigger so that North Springfield couldn't say they had the biggest hotel. And over the course of time, these two cities realized what a constant effort this was, what a constant pressure it was on them as far as their infrastructure and everything else to continue to build and build and build. So in the 1880s, they came to the conclusion that they really needed to merge and make one city. So the city fathers of both communities gathered together and they decided they would merge and call the whole entity Springfield. And the only things that would remain would be the two business districts, Commercial Street and the Square, and Division Street. But they still didn't trust each other. They still didn't really feel the vision of what it, would, what it could come to be. So they came up with a conclusion of how they would protect themselves from being left out of anything. They would form a new location for all the city and county government. Any kind of a service, a school, the courthouse, city hall. That's why we have a central street. It's halfway between Commercial Street and the square. So that neither side had an undue advantage. Neither side could go and tap on the shoulder of some bureaucrat or some administrator and get their ear easier than the other side. So that's the most prevalent souvenir we have of this time of two cities. But now for the good part. This has all been conflict. This has all been problems. This has all been things that, that have constantly driven the two communities to, to spend and spend and spend. When they merged together into one city, at the same time that that happened in the late 1880s, the economy of the entire United States had the biggest upheaval in its history. Worse than the Great Depression of the 1930s, worse than the financial crisis of 2008. The entire country was in just a terrible state of flux. But because these two little communities had worked at cross purposes to try to outgrow each other, they had established a base of infrastructure that was so much greater than either community could have hoped for based on their population. And because of that, in the late 1800s, in the 1890s, they were able to weather this economic storm, continue to grow, and progress into the 20th century as the leading community in southwest Missouri. So every feature of the new city, from electric lights to streetcars uh, to gas power, everything about them. I mean, Springfield was one of the first communities west of the Mississippi to have electric streetcars, one of the first west of the Mississippi to have telephones. 
All of these things were brought about because of that competition from north and south that we still see today to some extent. But the two communities, by merging together, by sharing their vision, they would, uh, they would have benefits that they never could have foreseen at that early time. Now, we'll circle back to that. Now we're going to move ahead to the 1940s. Springfield had fought its way through World War II. It was a nice, medium-sized uh, community of commerce and, and farm growth. Uh, lots of activity here. Most of the major stores from around the country had settled here and opened, uh, opened businesses like J.C. Penney's and Zales Jewelers and Montgomery Ward and, and uh, Sears Roebuck, people like that. They were all here. And the city was, uh, was really strong in its growth. Until late in the 1940s when there was a real serious problem with drought. Much of the city's commerce was controlled by small farms around the community. It was a place where people came in and sold the MFA and places like that, and then took that money and spent it and repurposed it into the economy of the city. Well, we had several years of drought, several years of incredibly high temperatures, uh, and it really had an impact on these small farms. And they began to go into debt. Well, because of that, a group of business people and city uh, administrators began to be concerned about it because it was impacting commerce. And they decided that the most important thing they could do was find ways to diversify the economy of the city of Springfield. And the best way to do that would be to attract new businesses and industry to the city to provide jobs for these people who wanted to stay on their little family farms, but also had needed a second method to pay off that debt. So in the late 1940s, early 1950s, the uh, city fathers, we'll call them, uh, and mothers, because there were women involved too, began a concerted effort to travel across the country and promote the city of Springfield to heavy industry. And because of that, in the early part of the 1950s, we saw people like Lily Tulip come to Springfield. Kraft Foods built a huge new plant here and established it as one of the biggest plants in their whole system. Dayton Tire and Rubber and Roy McBee, among others, built buildings here and put these people to work and afforded them the opportunity to save their family farms. We had an unprecedented pool of willing people who were very trainable and very eager to make these businesses a success. And luckily enough for us, we've been able to retain a good portion of them and kept them here as really good paying jobs, even today, many years later. It is, uh, it is with that that I will tell you the big finish of this, such as it is. As you can see, you've got to plan for the future and not for the present. Being proactive is the best approach. We cannot rest on our laurels. We can't sit and think about, as much as I think about the past, I do it every day, it's my, it's my job. But we can't sit on that and go, look what we did. Look what we did does nothing for us. Look what we're going to do. That's what does something for us. That's what gives young people a reason to hope. That's what gives people who are looking for work a reason to go out and find a place. Because look what we're going to do is the positive part of this. We've got a tremendous base. We've taken things that we never would have expected 
to have an impact on us, like the railroad passing the city by, or years of drought ruining our small farmers, and everything we have done because of a shared vision and a proactive approach, we have taken those things and made them positive for our community. And we can continue to do that only if we look to the future and not to where we are today or where we were last week. That has no bearing on it. And a positive and detailed vision of what the future should be is absolutely worthless unless you can get other people to share it. We've got to talk amongst ourselves. We've got to talk to each other and really listen to what the other people are saying so that we can capture what their, what their vision and intent is because that's the only way that we can move forward. We're working right now on a new huge museum project and I spend every day talking to people about the vision of what it's going to be like and the impact it's going to have on our community and what it's going to do for people who who are new to our community, who don't know our past and don't understand about North and South and why we have two old business districts and all the other things that come together with just a few little stories like I told today. But you've got to share that vision and you've got to get other people to listen to it. And they've got to be, they've got to be positive in their listening and positive in their approach to helping move that vision forward. As I said, Listen to others and be willing to join together to achieve goals that are beneficial to all of us. It's the only way we can, we know, only way we can move forward. And lastly, learn from the past. It's always the most sure teacher. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. If you, if you have any questions, I will be somewhere that they'll lead me to. Uh, in, a, in another room, a conversation room, uh, to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. <laughs>